Now we come to the upper end of the stem of life, the last universal common ancestor. But when did Luca exist, and what kind of environment did it live in? Most estimates for the age of the last universal common ancestor are between 3.7 and 3.5 billion years ago. One thing to note is that Luca doesn't refer to a single cell which divided, with one daughter cell ultimately giving rise to bacteria and the other giving rise to archaea. Rather, it refers to a population of organisms in a single habitat. What habitat was this? Well, in the tree of life, thermophilic heat-loving organisms are disproportionately deep-rooted, suggesting that Luca inhabited a hydrothermal environment. Now, is this hydrothermal vent a black or white smoker? The orientation of the modern ATP synthase enzyme, with protons on the outside, suggests it inhabited an acidic environment, implying that it resided in a volcanic vent versus a serpentinizing one. How did Luca compare to modern organisms? In the 2010s, the notion that it was an incredibly simple entity, barely being alive, gained traction. But in the past few years, new research has indicated that while Luca would have been more simple than an average modern prokaryote, it was still within the range of variation we see today. Luca lived at the tail end of the late heavy bombardment and being able to replenish energetic phosphates would have given it an advantage as the input of Schreibersite waned. Let's first take a look at the molecular biology of LUCA. Bacteria and archaea use non-homologous enzymes to transcribe and replicate DNA. This means that not only would translation be carried out by catalytic RNA, but replication and transcription would be as well. This would also mean the DNA would mutate at greater rates than in either bacteria or archaea, implying that using the standard molecular clock methods, where you assume that the rate of mutation would be between that of archaea and bacteria, will give you an age estimate much older than Luca actually was. When a study used this method, it gave an age estimate within 200 million years of the Earth's formation. Genomic analysis has indicated that Luca had some of the enzymes used by modern organisms to synthesize nucleotides. But at this time, we aren't sure if it had all of them or if some of the steps were catalyzed by ribozymes. Both archaea and bacteria use the FTSZ gene in binary fission to form a ring around the midsection of the cell where it divides. Step F anchors FTSZ to the membrane, and it was recently identified in archaea. Since it formed an outgroup, from bacterial step F genes, it would have been present in LUCA. This means that LUCA carried out cell division in a manner similar to modern prokaryotes. Finally, the di-GMP molecule used by prokaryotes for intracellular signaling was present in LUCA. One of the most striking differences between bacteria and archaea is the composition of the membrane. Both have lipids joined together by a glycerol, and one of the carbons on the glycerol is bound to a phosphate group. However, the glycerol of bacteria is bound to two hydrocarbon tails via ester bonds, while the archaeal glycerol is bound to a pair of chains of isoprenoids via ether bonds. This has led to speculation as to what kind of membrane LUCA had, with many mixtures of the two being hypothesized. This debate ignores some very basic principles of evolutionary biology. Most notably, that there is no rule which states that an ancestor of two taxa will have a character state which is intermediate between the character states of its descendants. The character state of one of the descendants can more closely resemble that of the ancestor than the other. What we know about prebiotic chemistry indicates that bacterial type lipids are easier to synthesize and thus are more likely to represent the primitive character state, with LUCA having phospholipids, which closely resembled bacterial ones. That said, there are some possible archaeal features of the membrane. LUCA probably lacked additional charged groups present on bacterial phospholipids, such as choline. Another difference between bacterial and archaeal lipids is the chirality, 
with a phosphate on the bacterial glycerol being on the third carbon, while it is on the first carbon, an archaea. LUCA had poor proteins, but not the diversity we see today. And while the membrane would have been less permeable than what came before it, it still would have to be more permeable than most modern membranes to facilitate the movement of materials across it. Having a mix of phospholipids with bacterial and archaeal chiralities would give it that middle ground in permeability. While only archaea incorporate them into phospholipids, both groups use isoprenoids. However, they use two different pathways, with bacteria using the mevalonate pathway, while archaea use MEP to produce isoprenoids. A newly identified clade of bacteria, known as CPR, possesses a pathway with features characteristic of both, which LUCA also would have used. Although many bacteria have two membranes, LUCA probably only had one. Interestingly, a recent analysis has indicated that the outer membrane of bacteria may be the remnant of a spore structure used by LUCA. What was the energy metabolism of LUCA like? It was tightly intertwined with its carbon metabolism, as LUCA was an acetogen, which used hydrogen emitted by volcanic vents to reduce carbon dioxide to acetate in order to produce energy. It possessed an RNF complex, which is also used by contemporary acetogens. This takes electrons from ferrodoxins, which pass through a series of iron sulfur clusters to an NAD, and the energy from the flow of electrons is used to pump ions out of the cell. Most of these ions would be sodium, but some would be protons as well. Apart from iron sulfur clusters, some vitamin B2 derivatives, FMN and FAD, are used to facilitate the flow of electrons through the RNF complex, along with methylene tetrahydrofolate dehydrogenase. These may have once been used as cytoplasmic electron carriers in old, which became bound to the enzymes. As time passed, the pathway would have become more specialized until only NAD was used as a cytoplasmic carrier. Bacteria and archaea both have carbon monoxide dehydrogenase enzymes with five subunits, but each domain possesses one subunit that is absent in the other. This means that LUCA either had four subunits and bacteria and archaea evolved their own additional subunit, or LUCA had all six subunits and one was lost in each lineage. But of the four subunits that were certainly present in LUCA, two are known to contain copper nickel cofactors suggesting that this feature could be ancient. Once acetyl-CoA is produced, it can either be fed into biosynthesis pathways, or it can be reacted with orthophosphate to replenish ATP and be released as acetate to power energy metabolism. 90% of the time, the latter is the case. The ATP synthase of LUCA would primarily be powered by the influx of sodium ions due to their greater abundance, but to a lesser extent, protons as well. Although carbon metabolism would have been linked to energy metabolism, LUCA had to assimilate other elements. For a while, it was thought that LUCA was diazotrophic, meaning it got its nitrogen from molecular nitrogen. However, Recent analysis has indicated that the nitrogenase enzyme, which converts molecular nitrogen to ammonia, came shortly after LUCA. LUCA may have taken ammonia from the environment like earlier organisms, or it could have had a progenitor to the nitrogenase enzyme, which metabolized hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide is a trace constituent of volcanic vent emissions now, but it would have been more abundant 3.6 billion years ago since the mantle hadn't yet lost all its nitrogen. Virtually all enzymes, which carry out life's core metabolic processes, were present in LUCA, and many of these enzymes have iron sulfur clusters and vitamin cofactors, which are nearly identical across all domains of life. This means that while the molecular biology of LUCA was more primitive and RNA-based than modern molecular biology, the metabolic machinery and inorganic chemistry of LUCA 
was on par with modern organisms. Luca likely would have taken up sulfur as hydrogen sulfide, phosphorus as orthophosphate, and iron as iron two, in a manner similar to acetogens. Living in a hydrothermal system, Luca would have to cope with toxic chemicals emitted from the vent. It possessed an arsenite oxidase gene, which was likely used to convert arsenite into the less reactive arsenate, and this was the ancestor of the diverse molybdeterin oxidoreductase enzyme family. Lastly, LUCA had oxidative stress proteins, and the source of oxidative stress was probably sulfite. In summary, the first organisms would have depended on wet, dry, hot, cold, and acidic alkaline cycles in the environment to drive their cellular biology. Initially, ribozymes were responsible for the genetic and molecular processes, while mineral catalysts facilitated early metabolic reactions. The inclusion of B vitamins would lead to the formation of autocatalytic reaction networks, allowing the first organisms to become more self-sustained and less dependent on local geochemical processes. Amino acids were added to these early catalysts followed by peptides leading to modern enzymes. The genetic code probably arose from the production of dipeptide cofactors. As time passed, old became more autotrophic as the wood young doll pathway developed. The reactive nature of acetyl-CoA would have kept early metabolic synthesis pathways such as the TCA cycle and pentose phosphate pathway flowing in a unidirectional manner. Environmental polyphosphates derived from triboside corrosion would negate any need to replenish ATP for the first few hundred million years. The ATP synthase enzyme itself likely evolved from a proton sodium pump whose reaction direction was reversed after electron transport with hydrogen as the initial donor and carbon as the final acceptor was used to pump these ions out of the cell. LUCA itself was an autotrophic acetogen inhabiting a volcanic hydrothermal system.